Well, happy to be here today in Blister headquarters with Adam Miller, uh, the founder of Revel, the founder of Y Cycles, and backing up a bit, the founder of Borealis back in the day, and I think maybe the founder of one or two other companies. Like this dude apparently just founds companies. So um, today I'm very interested actually to to get more of the backstory on you and talk a little bit about this interesting trajectory of yours and, uh, you know, all the way up to the present where we're going to talk about uh, some pretty new Revel products. Um, so this is going to be a fun one. And uh, welcome to Crested Butte and welcome to Blister Headquarters. Cool. I'm happy to be here. I love Crested Butte. There's not too many dry trails right now, so I'll <laughs> save riding for next time I come over, but happy to be here. Another thing that's pretty interesting about this is you have kind of been on my radar for a while because uh, you were in college with a couple of like some of the very first blister reviewers back in the day, uh, Julia Van Ralty, uh, Will Brown. And we always joke actually that like Colorado College was just sort of in the early days, uh, this kind of bastion uh, for uh, I guess blister reviewer recruitment or something. So this is pretty interesting to finally get to sit down with you in person and uh, yeah, but yeah, it's it, kind of a funny small world thing. I, Julia, I met on the very first day of college, um, and huh. I've heard about Blister for for years. And so, just I mean, we just started talking last week about doing this podcast. So it's kind of like, you know, I'd heard about you but never met you before. Yeah. So it's it's a small world, mountain <laughs> town, Colorado. I don't know what it is thing, but so again, I think you've you've just got a lot of interesting things going on. And so this, you know, I, I'm personally interested to to learn more of the details. So. Let's take this back and just talk about where you grew up. Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll kind of start from the beginning and ramble on about my, my bike past. Uh, I grew up in Anchorage, Alaska, got super into biking when I, when I was like 11 years old. Uh, I joined a little kid's bike program. Um, my parents were nice enough to buy me, you know, my first mountain bike, a Gary Fisher Marlin. Um, nice fantastic great first bike uh, when I was like 11 years old um, and I just got hooked and I was into uh, you know like skiing cross-country skiing downhill skiing kind of all that stuff growing up in Alaska I went fishing all the time and hunting uh, but biking like from day one is what I just kind of fell in love with um, I was lucky enough to get a job at one of the local bike shops when I was 14 years old like as soon as I was legally allowed to work <laughs> um, and it was pretty sweet they hired me at minimum wage and a week later I got a 50 cent an hour raise because um, they <laughs> thought I knew enough about bikes or whatever. And so um, I always kind of remember that. And those guys, uh, Jamie and Bill, who owned Chain Reaction Cycles at the time in mm. Anchorage, were fantastic. Like they taught me everything. A few of the guys I worked with at the bike shop there just totally like, I mean, they taught me everything about bikes themselves, but then about, you know, riding bikes and, you know, everything. It was a really cool experience. So working at the bike shop was great. I mean, I would, I would skip high school class to go to work, you know, cause I was just loved working there and I learned everything I possibly could about bikes. Um, actually to go back a little bit before that, before I even started working at the bike shop, I, I was, I was a total geek, you know, I kind of obsessed over everything. And I, I kind of started this business when I was like 11 or 12 years old where I'd, uh, I got a PayPal account and I think my parents freaked out cause that was, you know, 15 years or 18 years ago and yeah. before PayPal was like, you know, <laughs> sending money on the internet's <laughs> horrible. Sketchy stuff, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and and I'd, I'd buy like mountain bikes on eBay and get them home and pull them all apart and sell all the parts individually, like the derailleurs and, you know, sell them off and the brakes and sell those off. And, and actually made pretty good money at that. Um, and that's what got me into like kind of learning all the, you know, about bikes and then learning about the business side of it. Um, and I actually, you know, made more money doing that than any job I had till, um, probably till I sold Borealis, honestly. Huh. So, um, that was kind of the, the, the early days of the bike stuff. Um, and then through the bike shop, through Chain Reaction, where I worked, uh, the owners of that bike shop started a company called 907 Bikes, um, which they, they manufactured fat bikes. That was back in like 2000, uh, seven or eight or nine before really any other companies were making fat bikes. But up in Alaska, if you were into bikes, you rode fat bikes six months out of the year. It's just, it was just how you, just what you did. Um, so I worked for them. I kind of learned that, oh, you could have an idea. You could find a factory. And at the time they started in Oregon and then moved to Taiwan and then China. If you had an idea, you could 
find a factory and make this thing and make a bike that was better than other bikes out there. And I thought that was like the coolest thing ever. Mm -hmm. And the uh, Jamie and Bill were nice enough to kind of involve me in some of that on some level, just mm -hmm. so I could kind of learn how all that worked. Uh, so I went to, um, I moved out of Alaska to go to Colorado College in 2010 and was kind of still working um, for, for Jamie and Bill. And I actually helped them move a kind of shipping warehouse from Alaska down to Ogden, Utah at the time. Huh. And then that helped me learn a lot of the mechanics and logistics behind uh, kind of bike company stuff. So I uh, got a great opportunity there. Kind of moving, moving past all that stuff. Um, Just to slow you down for a second, I'm curious if you have a sense of how many people who say go on to found bike companies had that kind of early involvement and introduction to the whole factory side of things. And we've got to create a shipping center, you know. Um, I can't say that I'm very familiar with that story, but maybe you know something I don't. You know, I actually, I'd be fascinated to hear the answer to that. I would imagine a lot of founders of company, of bike companies have started working in bike shops when yeah. they were young. It's kind of such a the passion, bike shop thing, yeah. passion driven thing. I feel like I got very lucky by being involved in a bike shop so I could see kind of the customer side of things. I got fit certified so I could do fits on, on customers. And so I really learned about geometry. Um, but then to have that bike shop also be involved in manufacturing products in, in Taiwan. Um, and I, I just kind of saw the basics of it, just the outskirts, but it was just enough to kind of get me hooked to say, oh, if I learn more, I could do that. And uh, so I feel like I got very lucky by having that whole experience from when I was 14 years old. I yeah. mean, that's, that's pretty cool. <laughs> so before you're making decisions, you're like, okay, I think I'm going to go to college. Was the bug already planted about maybe I'll start a bike company someday? And if so, where should I go to school or what should I study to kind of make that happen? Or is that, how did the story Yeah, I mean, work? I was a total lost kid. I mean, I loved uh, working in the bike shop. I was a diehard bike racer. I was lucky enough to have parents that helped support me through that. So I traveled out of Alaska a few times to go to some bigger races and tried to kind of make it uh, in that scene a little bit. Uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I loved business stuff. I mean, I worked in the shop. Um, I, I painted decks all summer long and I mowed lawns and I did all that kind of classic stuff to like make money so I could buy bikes. And I started figuring out the cycle where if you work at the bike shop, you get a discount. So if I, you know, painted 10 decks and I worked at the bike shop for two months, I could afford to buy this, you know, my next Orbea race bike or, well, you know, whatever it was. Um, and so I, I always kind of liked the business side of things, but it was always a means to an end. It was business so I could yep. have my own cool bikes that I could go race on. Yeah. Um, and so I knew at the, you know, growing up in Alaska, um, I, when I was getting ready to go to college, I knew I wanted to go somewhere where I could bike. Um, and so I, you know, kind of stumbled across Colorado College, knew someone who had gone there and, uh, and I visited and fell in love with it and I applied early action and um, got in and kind of didn't know what I wanted to do, but maybe some business stuff and some bike stuff. So I, I knew I could race bikes there. And uh, you know, I, second semester, senior year of high school, I knew where I was going in college. So I think my attendance was like 42%. And I literally would just skip class to like ride my bike or go to the bike shop and work or you know, <laughs> steal my parents' car and do dumb high school kid stuff or, or whatever it was. But I was pretty excited to get to Colorado and, and you know, explore mountain biking out of kind of small town, awesome Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's talk a little bit more about racing. Um, what events did you start gravitating toward? And like, were you thinking, like, was there a time where you're like, I kind of wonder about being like a pro racer or were you just a kid that liked racing what what was that part yeah of this? i mean i loved bike racing growing up in alaska it's such a small kind of tight-knit community uh and you're far away from everything else so the races were you know tuesday night mountain bike races or, or there's some weekend races but it was all pretty small and kind of the same crowd of people but i was lucky enough to get on a kind of junior bike team um a woman named janice tower started it uh, back in you know early 2000s and i was uh, able to get on this team kind of sponsored by the local coffee shop and the local bike shop 
shop and we did group workouts and that really got me into the bike race thing. And so we did uh, a lot of, a lot of road bike racing. Um, I did a lot of triathlon stuff, which I don't usually admit now that I sell, you know, full suspension mountain bikes. <laughs> uh, I did, I love cyclocross racing and then uh, cross country mountain biking was my, was my main thing. Yeah. So we, we traveled out of Alaska once a summer or so, you know, kind of whatever made sense. Uh, to do some of those events. I went to road bike nationals, mountain bike nationals, all, all in high school. Hmm. When I got to college, that was when, you know, small town Alaska racing was one thing. Going to Colorado and racing collegiate and then racing kind of the normal races, uh, USGP cyclocross stuff, uh, Mountain States Cubs, cross country mountain biking. It was the real deal. And mm -hmm. I thought it was amazing. It was very different than the, than the racing I grew up in. Uh, so I realized within a few months that I hated road biking. Road bike racing in Alaska was great because it's kind of a fun community. <laughs> yeah, when I got to the kind of more serious crowd in Colorado, it just wasn't my thing. Huh. Um, just a different kind of attitude. Um, whereas the mountain biking was really competitive, but really fun. It was friendly competition. If people drank beer afterwards, it's just mm -hmm. a good time. And I kind of, uh, I, I did for, for a couple of years in there, I think I had a chance to kind of do the pro thing, which pro cross country mountain biking is, you know, th th there's a, a, a big definition of that. There's yeah. very few people who make a full fat salary. Yeah. Uh, and then there's a lot of people kind of in between. So I knew I could maybe get to that level of getting some free bikes and some free race entries and, and whatnot. And then I, through college, I had this opportunity to go to Africa for, for a summer hmm. and learn uh, a Wolof, a West African language. And I kind of thought, well, I could really focus on mountain bike racing and try to go semi-pro there or go to Africa. So I went <laughs> to Africa and um, that effectively ended any chance I had at becoming a pro mountain bike racer, but I don't think I really had a chance at getting there anyway. So uh, then I decided, well, if I can't be a pro racer, which I wanted to do, but kind of in the back of my head, I always knew I wasn't quite good enough to do that, then I'll, I'll try to make bikes. So that's when the idea for, let's see how I can get involved in, in, yeah. in bikes as a career. Um, that's where it all started. What'd you go, what'd you study as an undergrad? Did you come in to study one, you know, one or two things and that's what you stuck with or did that shift up while you were an undergrad? No, it was one of those liberal arts colleges where you can kind of experiment and, you know, learn a bunch of different stuff. And so I, I came in not knowing what I wanted to do besides that I liked economics and, and, and business. Uh, so I, I gravitated towards that. I, I did economics with a focus in, in business and marketing and then an African studies minor. I traveled to Africa a couple times, uh, took a semester off and did the whole dirt bag uh, backpacking across South and East Africa by myself. Um, and actually that's where I did a lot of the like communication with the first uh, Chinese factory I worked with for Borealis while I was backpacking across Africa. <laughs> uh, so it's kind of a weird multicultural experience. But what, what was the, what, I mean, why Africa? You just that you were just fascinated by the place, or you were thinking this might somehow. Yeah, I was fascinated. You know, the first time I, I needed to get a language credit to graduate college, and and I've tried learning Spanish for ten years of my life, and I, I just my brain doesn't work that way. I'm not very good at languages, so <laughs> I found this uh, summer class, and it was free. If you you know you could do one summer course for free, uh, so it was this. this a, Colorado College summer class in West Africa for two months, and I went there, and, and it was great. We got that, that that sparked this bug of like, well, you can travel to third world countries yes. and see crazy stuff. And I mean, I got I got caught in a in a uh, tear gas. You know, I was shot at by police. We were on a bus that got flipped over by protesters. Like all this cool stuff that just kind of sparked this like cool. I, I mean, I was always kind of an adventurous kid and um, had traveled a bit, but not to like those crazy wild yeah. places. So uh, after that summer course, that's when I was like, oh shit, Africa's cool. Um, I ended up getting a job on a farm, which kind of paid for living for a couple months in South Africa uh, and took a semester off school. And that's where I sort of started Borealis while romping around South Africa. So. That's amazing. Um, man, I'm, I am still... I didn't go off to Africa as an undergrad. I'm, I'm jealous listening to this, but those those times of like, I think being in school and getting abroad, getting yourself abroad, I mean, I suspect you would agree. I mean, the classroom's great and books are great, but man, if you can fling yourself out into the world somewhere, turns out it... Uh, it was crazy. I mean, it, it taught me so much and it, it's cliche, but you know, it, it was such a, 
mind expanding experience to spend time in Africa and get yourself in sketchy situations and ask strangers if you can sleep on their floor and work on a farm. I'd never worked on a farm yeah. before. You know, I branded cattle in 125 degree weather in South Africa for a few days. And like, those are experiences I'd never do. I mean, hopefully I get to do something like that again, but yeah. uh, that's a good time of your life to do that weird stuff. And I think yeah. that kind of got me hooked into maybe taking a career path that wasn't, um, it was kind of abnormal, I suppose. <laughs> the story is the story is pretty good, um, and and so so let's talk a little bit now. We're kind of starting to move into the actual, I guess, bike business trajectory. So um, you have this first thought um, for a bike company, and what's what's the thinking at the time? I mean, all right, so maybe I'll start a bike ish company but take it from there i mean how, how did you start homing in on like what exactly you wanted to do and wanted this thing to be yeah and i think i didn't even decide that i wanted to start a bike company in, in in the beginning i just knew i liked bikes and if i could make that a career and kind of prove people wrong that you know you have to do a certain career path i i, I don't know I, I just liked bikes and thought man if i can if i can make a living at this that's pretty sweet mm -hmm. so i was i was working for 907 fat bikes at the time in learning a little bit and I was seeing that bike shops were kind of interested in these weird new fat bikes. A lot of bike shops would laugh at me, you know, and I'd have to leave. But I, at the time there was only steel and aluminum fat bikes out yep. there and they're really heavy and kind of old school, not that nice and just made for someone who already owns four bikes and maybe they get a fifth bike and it's their fat bike to ride for a few months a year in the winter. So I saw an opportunity there to make a really high end fat bike. And that was in 2012, I started that company. And I just thought, well, I'm in college. Uh, I'm gonna start this company as a hobby. So I, I stopped working at 907, took some time and kind of figured out how I was gonna make this carbon, you know, lightweight fat bike. And I knew kind of, I knew a lot, I knew a little bit about a lot of things, I suppose. And so that was just a fantastic learning experience that I've, you know, couldn't be more thankful to gone through all that for, you know, everything I'm doing with, with Y cycles and Revel now. But I thought, okay, I'm going to make a lightweight fat bike. Um, I ended up, I didn't have any money, of course, as, as a college student. Um, I found a, a business partner, an investor who was kind of a friend of the colleges, had helped teach some classes there at Colorado College. And uh, he had recently sold a few businesses. Uh, I was very well off financially and kind of was ready to do something fun. Mm -hmm. And so I got very lucky to kind of meet up with him. I'd interviewed several other kind of potential investors and business partners, but I didn't know a lot about setting up a company. I knew I wanted a lightweight fat bike and that was about as far as it went. So I flew to China. I found some factories on Alibaba.com. I went to China for three weeks and kind of just <laughs> stopped at a bunch of them. I mean, I walked into factories that were phenomenal and I walked into factories that are everything you hear is the worst stereotypes about huh. Chinese manufacturing. And then I walked into factories that, you know, like you want a Cervelo P5 for $400 or a set of Zip wheels for, for $300? Like they just made knockoff. Yeah carbon stuff that would probably explode in a little bit. And so I kind of, that trip, I was like, holy hell, these Chinese factories are crazy. And what was really cool about that is, I mean, I was 21 years old at the time, and I was just a kid with an idea, and I flew to China, and these factories would just roll out the red carpet for me. I never, you know, in America, you always get the, oh, you're just a right. kid, or, or right. you kind of get talked down on if you don't have a big resume. And from that first trip to China, I, I love manufacturing in Asia. And right now we are going crazy making recyclable composite wheels in America. These are made four hours away from here. I think American manufacturing is incredible. But that first experience working in China and what I still have there is, is if you have an idea and you want to turn it into something, you get treated like royalty there and they yeah. will help you make it happen. So um, I got very lucky meeting a good factory there um, that sort of helped me make the first carbon Borealis fat bike. So uh, was in Africa communicating drawings. I got this little mini laptop so I could email and like Wi-Fi cafes in Africa and mm -hmm. talk to this factory. And we ended up getting our first prototype. We built up these fat bikes. At the time, the lightest fat bike was like 29 or 30 pounds. And we built like a 23 pound fat bike, like just way lighter mm -hmm. and it was cool looking and modern at the time geometry now it looks old and lame but at the time everyone's like well that's the coolest looking fat bike and so we it's it kind of a funny story how it all launched we rented some space from a bike shop for a few hundred bucks a month to just store stuff in their basement 
because I was living in a dorm room. Uh, Steve, my business partner, kind of helps you know set up the business stuff and in, in the background. Uh, he put up a lot of quite a bit of, of funding so we could order our first round of materials and everything. And it was it was the summer before my senior year that we were finally ready to launch. So I was living in this college house. Uh, we did all of our financial projections and thought we might be able to sell 50 of these bikes in the first year. Still go to college full time. This would yeah. be a hobby. Work out in the evening. The thought of hiring an employee was not even on the table. It was just me and Steve like to put some money in and you know we'll we'll see what we can make happen. And it, it was, I very specifically remember this day. It was June one. Uh, we were ready to launch this this bike company and. We had, you know, one prototype that we took some pictures of. I sent, a, I just went to the contact form on bikerumor.com. I didn't even know a, anybody in the media and said, hey, we're a new bike company. You know, here's a press release that I had written up. And I put my own, my personal cell phone number on there. We didn't have a business phone number because it was supposed to be a hobby. And we just had this big party at my college house with five roommates the night before. And there's beer cans everywhere and beer pong tables set up. And I woke up and um, was having coffee. And I didn't even know when this article was going to go on bikerumor.com and all of a sudden my phone started ringing and my phone kept on ringing and I was ignoring all the calls because it was like 9 a.m. on a Wednesday of huh. you know college summer and I was probably pretty hungover and I started answering the phone and all you know someone said look at bikerumor.com and our sure enough our press release was up there and in about three hours I, I started answering the phone I got my pen and paper out <laughs> I was answering the phone we sold we sold those 50 bikes that I thought we were going to sell in the first year in about three hours. And I would say things like, well, I, actually at the time, um, backcountry.com called that morning and they said they wanted to sell the bikes and their opening order was significantly larger than what I thought we were going to sell for the, <laughs> for the for whole first year. And I had to, I said, oh, excuse me, let me get to my desk in my office. And I put the phone on mute and it was like screaming and stuff. Um, wow. And then, uh, you know, tried to act all professional. We didn't have an office. Yeah. Uh, so I wrote down their order on a, notepad and, and I called Steve by the time I had some time and said, we got to rethink this. I think we got a real business. Um, and then very quickly, and he was like, hell yeah, let's, let's make this happen. So very quickly we ramped up orders with the factory, um, put a whole bunch more money in, into the business to buy enough parts for all these orders we got, uh, rented a space in downtown Colorado Springs. Within like a week, I was a owner of a of a real business, not like a hobby kind yeah. of thing. Um, and so all that was like, it was just this whirlwind um, where we we sold a lot of bikes. Um, we were the only company at the time with a lightweight carbon fat bike and people wanted it way more than I ever thought people would want that bike. I mean, within four months, I was traveling to, to Europe multiple times. We had distributors in like 30 something countries. Uh, I was going to China every few months to check in on the factory. Uh, we We, sold over a million dollars of bikes within a few months um, while I was in college. Luckily, my professors were quite nice. And, <laughs> uh, they allowed me to take a lot of classes pass fail because I'd like be in class till noon, run to the office, you know, the office is a mile away from, from school. And I told myself from the beginning, I was like, hey, I have this business, but I'm still going to have a fun senior year. Huh. And so I'd like go to work, you know, for eight hours and get back home and do the whole college party thing. And, and it was a really fun, like I barely slept that whole year. It was just, it was a really fun, exciting time. So. So just to keep the timeline right, you said you, you launched or the story came out, you said June 1st? June 1st of 2013. June 1st, 2013. And you're 21 at that time? I was, I was 21. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we went to the big trade show in Vegas that that fall. And I'd been a few other times uh, with the other company and bike shop, but I was kind of the cool brand at this big trade show in Las huh. Vegas, you know, 21. And a few of my college roommates came with me because we didn't have enough employees at the time. So <laughs> they came with me to help at the trade show. And of course we we're in Vegas as 21 year olds thinking, oh, this company's paying for us to be in Vegas. And it was a really <laughs> kind of surreal, fun time. Hmm. So I know we got to get on to, you know, two other companies here, but um, so talk a little bit then, um, you know, you are no longer involved with Borealis. And so I suspect there were some lessons learned in here <laughs> and, uh, and probably an interesting story or two, but what happened? I mean, you're this 21 year old, this business is like blown up immediately. I, 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 learned a ton through the whole Borealis process. So started the company, it was going incredibly well. 
I, I was I was 21 years old. I had a business partner who was you know to- twice my age at least. I was the youngest person in the building. After about six months, we had 17 employees, and that was pretty cool. I mean, it was all of a sudden it was pretty neat. I remember specifically I had a phone call with my um, with my parents a couple months before college graduation, and they kind of said, "So." And my parents were ridiculously supportive through all this. I mean, they were fantastic and um, could could not have done any of this w- without them. Mm. Uh, but this one phone call, they said, "So you know, what so what are you going to do after graduation? Like, are you going to get a job or, or go to grad school?" And I, and I said, "You know, mom, dad, I, I have seventeen employees. We're you know, like multi million dollar business." <laughs> and, and that's when it kind of hit me that like, "Whoa, this is real, and this is what I'm doing." Yeah. And and it was just a funny conversation. And now they're they're just, they're so supportive of everything they always have been. But uh, so so the business was going very well. My business partner and I started to see things very differently. So uh, we were just growing so fast. There was always it was always a cash flow problem because our we were so new. None of our vendors would give us credit terms, so we had to fund everything. So to buy 200 frames, to buy parts for 200 frames and wheels for 200 frames, you know, all that added up. So my business partner Steve kind of kept putting a lot of money in, um, and, and and I did a little bit too, but he definitely funded the majority of it, and we were equal 50/50 partners. Uh, one thing you learn in business school is never be 50-50 partners. You should always have a 51 and a 49 or something like that. So there's always someone that can have the final say. So to me, the business was really like my baby because it's my idea and I started it and I was the bike guy. And so Steve and I just saw things very differently. He had come from, um, he made a lot of money in packaging and selling uh, aluminum cans. And so it's more of a commodity business, yeah. whereas bikes are a passion yeah. business. And you have to have the very best product out there and believe in it so that you can sell that. So our mentalities were just very different. So we decided after a little while, we weren't, we weren't having fun working together. So we actually pursued uh, selling the company. Uh, and we were, we were too new. We actually had some really big offers on the table where I was 22 living in a house that had a leaky roof for 400 bucks a month. And, you know, the boiler was out for two months. We heated the house with the, with the ovens on, you know, like <laughs> I, I had no money, um, but the business was killing it. And we had these offers on the table for people to buy us out for the, an amount of money that was, you know, numbers I never imagined. And then these kind of private equity companies realized, hey, you, you two business partners aren't getting along. Business is going great, but there's some weird personnel issues. So, uh, Bottom line is in 2000, end of 2000, uh, what is this now? 14, it's only a year and a half wow. of operating the business. We kind of had, to, it, it, it had to end. We were basically, I was going to buy Steve out or Steve was going to buy me out. And I had no money. Um, <laughs> my parents were very supportive and they'd loaned me some money here and there. They gave us some loans, which was really nice. Paid them all back. It was it was great, but not, not enough money to, to buy out my business partner. So it was really, it kind of went from just the coolest thing ever to, I saw the ruthless side of, of business. You know, I, I sort of thought bikes are all, you know, bike businesses is all dirt bags and Moab trips and camping and selling bikes all over the world. And that's w- what you see on the outside. Mm-hmm. But I pretty quickly learned that it is, you know, when money gets involved, it's a ruthless business world. It mm-hmm. um, doesn't matter that you're selling toys. It matters that there's a lot of money on the line. So uh, I had to hire a lawyer. Um, my parents are both lawyers, but they were, you know, very, they don't do that type of law. So it was kind of like, here, go, go hire your lawyer. And I, you know, was able to convince the lawyer to take a small, much smaller retainer than hmm. normal. And I put it on a credit card and, uh, I was, you know, um, just out of college paying my lawyer a lot of money to figure out how we were going to, uh, part ways, um, and how I wasn't going to lose everything. And, and, um, eventually I sold my 50% share of the business to Steve, um, and again, everything, you know, the, the way I say it is there's, you know, people, sometimes people get divorced and there's good divorces yeah. where it's all amicable and friendly and Hey, you're great and you're great, yeah. but we just don't get along. And then there's bad divorces where it's nasty and people are throwing plates and, you know, and we had one that was much more, um, a business partnership that was much more on the nasty divorce side of things. Mm-hmm. And that's when I learned how important it is to work with the right people and work with people who share your same values. Uh, it, 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 was, it, was, it was just not a fun time in my life. So I sold my, my part of the business for, for pennies on the dollar compared to what it was worth. I mean, we were very profitable after a year and a half in business. Uh, but I kind of just had the mentality that, you know, if I'm going to ride my bike and smile again and, you know, not come back to my college house and, 
<laughs> you know, I had the worst time ever because I was spending all my money on lawyers, money that I didn't have on lawyers. Yeah. Uh, I just had to sell it. So sold my half of the company for about a week. And that was, that was uh, Jan- January 1, 2015 is when that happened. Mm-hmm. Um, for about a week, I was saying, man, there's no freaking way I'm ever working in the bike industry again. I'm never having my own business again. You know, mm-hmm. this is just the worst experience ever. Then a week later, I said, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good at making bikes. <laughs> I really like this. There's a, the bike industry is the best thing possible. I just saw, I think, the worst hmm. side of it and the worst thing that can happen when you don't set things up right in the beginning. I mean, we wanted to save so much money. We made our um, shareholder agreement on rocketlawyer.com for a uh, you know, $1.99 monthly first trial thing. Turns out it's worth it to go to a lawyer and spend money to set up your partnership documents properly in the beginning. So. Hmm. Um, uh, my parents weren't too happy to hear hear that one after the fact, <laughs> since they're both lawyers yeah. and would have helped us out. But I was kind of a stubborn kid and wanted to do it myself. So um, for about a week, I didn't was like, ah, screw bikes, this this sucks. And then I thought, man, bikes are bikes are my life. Bikes are what I I know very well. And I kind of got this fire in my belly that it took a little while to sort of brew and figure out. But I knew I wanted to do it again, and I wanted to do it better. And 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 I knew I could. So I actually went and got a job in a bike shop three days a week in, in Denver. Um, part of the business sale was uh, my, my truck. Um, it was, I, uh, we had a little hard time in, at one point in the business and I actually sold my car to make payroll one, one day. So um, sold my car on a Wednesday, made payroll on a Friday, took 500 bucks of that car sale out to pay my rent. And then a month later I bought, bought a used tr- but nice truck for myself. So it's kind of like, it was just this wild time where things were wow. like, it was just a, a startup company in like every sense of the world word in every sense that you can imagine. And, yeah. and I mean, a month after that, where I'd sold my car to make payroll, like I remember having this conversation with Steve where he's like, Hey, can you take these checks to the bank? And I was like, no, man, I don't have time to take the checks to the bank. And he's like, well, dude, I don't have time to take the checks yeah. to the bank. And I looked at it and it was $70,000 worth of checks. And we were both like, no, we don't have time to do that. And I just have this vivid memory of that where it's like, man, we didn't have time to deposit 70 grand of checks. Yeah. Like we were selling a lot of bikes. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> so anyway, p- part of the business, uh, sorry, went on a rant. Part of the business sale was the truck that was mine. And I didn't even know this thing was gonna go through till I, literally I saw Steve sign this piece of paper with the lawyer. So he signed the piece of paper, I signed it, I'd hand over my keys and I didn't have a car. All my belongings <laughs> were like in my shitty little college house room. Um, <laughs> And I actually asked the lawyer on the other side to drive me home and just made him feel bad the whole time. And <laughs> poor, it was, it's probably not the most professional thing to do, but you know, they drove me home, dropped me off at my house and didn't say a word the whole time. Wow. Um, I was maybe a little immature about some of those things, but uh, so I moved, then that night, literally I was like, I gotta get out of here. A friend of mine picked me up. I moved to Denver, signed a lease on a new house. I uh, got a job working part-time at a bike shop and it was the best thing ever. I worked at Pedal of Littleton hmm. um, just as a bike sales guy. And it was so cool to work with bikes and work with people who were stoked on bikes and not have any stress. Yeah. And I went in and said, I don't need the money. I just want to work. Huh. Um, and it was like this really good mental thing to kind of bring me back from this really bad business experience to why I really liked bikes. Yeah. And. So that was kind of like this big reset. And then I uh, decided to drive up to Alaska, went back home. I kind of needed a summer off. I wasn't planning on this like quarter life crisis thing. I was 22 at the time. Uh, so packed up, packed up the truck with a dog, drove to Alaska, spent all summer like, I mean, I, I had money in the bank, which I had never had before. I yeah. did sell my company. It, it wasn't yeah. for what it was worth, but I, I didn't have financial <laughs> worries. And so I went fishing every day. Um, <laughs> hung out with my parents a lot and they, they had been very helpful through this whole kind of business partnership breakup. And so it was just this really like big sense of relief. Went fishing a bunch, rode my bike a bunch and just had a great time. By the end of the summer, I realized um, I kind of got obsessed with um, making smoked salmon. So I caught all these salmon and then I like learned how to make smoked salmon. And at, like week three of me doing nothing but like riding my bike fishing and then making smoked salmon in the backyard of my parents' house. I thought, all right, it's time to, time to get your life back on, back on track. So um, I had an opportunity to move to, to Utah um, to do a kind of a bike business thing with a guy named Jason Shears, the founder of Envy Composites. So packed up the truck at the end of that, you know, summer off that I wasn't planning on, mental reset summer, whatever you want to yeah. call it. Uh, I drove down to Ogden, Utah where they have a whole lot of tax credits for outdoor businesses. And this guy was very supportive and said, hey, if you ever want to 
you know, start a bike company again, let me know, I'll help you out. And he had started and later sold Envy Composites. Um, they sold again a year or two later uh, for $52 million. He, he's yeah. a carbon composites genius and a business genius and was just very supportive. And at the time I was like, you know, hell yeah, I'm gonna move to Ogden, Utah and start another bike company. How, but wait a sec, pause on that. Like, when did you first meet Jason or how I? Yeah, so, I mean, that was the coolest thing about Borealis. I met- You started meeting everybody. I, I met That's everybody. Okay. Like we, I mean, within a month, I was going to trade shows in Europe and shaking hands with people that I'd read about in magazines yeah. and thought I'd never meet these people. And yeah. they were saying, you just made the lightest fat bike. You made the coolest fat bike. It was such a trending product at that time. I got to meet everybody in yep. a period of a few months. Got it. Was it. The coolest thing so the ever. Rolodex just went. Yeah, and and biking the bike industry it's like anything, but it's extra tight. I mean, networking is how you meet people. Yeah. Uh, through that, I was able to. I mean, the networking in Asia is a whole different level of small world, but all, all over between um, Taiwan and and China and now Vietnam and Myanmar and Cambodia, where bikes are made. But I mean, in a period of a year, I met people all over Asia that made bikes and all over the U.S. that made bikes. So Jason who started Envy was very helpful through Borealis. And, and he had gone through a very similar business partnership breakup huh. with, with Envy. That's right. And I, I actually, he, he was fantastic through that process for about the you know five or six months so that you're I was talking, going through that. So you're talking with Jason a lot yeah. during the Borealis. Oh, almost every day. Got it. Halfway as a you know therapist, half yeah. as a advice with how to talk to your lawyer about this stuff. He was super helpful. And through all that, he was saying, hey, when you sell this company or when you get out of this horrible mess you're in, uh, let me know if you want to start something up. Had he said that to you before you went to Alaska and were smoking yep. sand? Okay, so you you <laughs> yeah. already, I'm very, it's always very interesting to me like when these seeds of the idea got planted. But yep. Jason had already put this in your mind. He did. Okay. Yep. And then, and he was nice enough. I mean, two months later, there's, there's a, always a big, trade show in Taipei in, in the spring. And he said, hey, just come on over to Taipei. You know, we're all going over. So I got to go to Taipei with Jason and all these other like crazy company founders. And I was sitting there in, at the Taipei show thinking, oh, this is pretty cool. Huh. It's just really helpful for networking. And that's when we talked a little bit, a bit more about uh, me moving to Ogden and starting something up there. Got it. So you moved to Ogden. Packed up the truck and drove down. Okay. All right, let's keep going with this cool. story. I'll, yeah, keep, I'll just, keep rolling. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I had a summer job in Ogden. That's actually how I met Jason originally, a uh, summer job working for the 907 Fat Bikes. So um, I knew Ogden just a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I moved there, bought a house because I figured, well, um, it's a smart investment. I'll put a little bit of money aside <laughs> towards the house, spend the rest of the money on a bike company. And I... <laughs> I'd always been really into titanium bikes. Um, and, and, and actually the, the whole time I knew and through talking with Jason, I wanted to make carbon full suspension bikes. I had done carbon fat bikes. I knew what I, the ultimate in, in bikes and the whole bike industry is a carbon full suspension bike. You have to have the best carbon layup. So materials are super important, but kinematics get real complicated. It's pretty easy for people to go out and make a road bike or a hard tail. There's nothing that moves on the frame. Yeah. So, car so carbon full suspension bikes, in my mind, was the was the pinnacle. That's what I wanted to make because I kind of had this fire in my belly after Borealis, where we had this crazy successful company, and it was kind of taken away from me and not, you know, not necessarily by my choice. I got very lucky. Looking back, I wouldn't change a thing. I'm, I'm thrilled with the experience, but I wanted to take kind of that feeling and make it into the best company I could. So I'm couldn't be happier with, with that whole experience. It really kicked everything else off. So I was a total, I, th I thought titanium bikes were cool because they were just artistic and handmade and, and funky and different. And I liked funky, weird fat bikes. So I thought titanium bikes were cool and I knew I wanted to make the best carbon full suspension bikes because that's the you know, cream of the crop, hardest, most difficult product to make, but also the product I liked riding the most. I mean, I've been living in Colorado for uh, what, five, six years at that point going to you know Winter Park Downhill Resort, all that yeah. stuff. I liked these bikes, so I wanted to make them better. So Jason helped me with everything. Um, I re rented a you know half of the warehouse that he was renting for his engineering projects he was working on. Um, and I thought, you know what, let's start small. Uh, I'm gonna start a company that makes titanium bikes. I wanted to make a gravel bike and a plus hardtail because at the time fat bikes were cool. Plus, plus tires were just sort of starting mm -hmm. to become a thing. So I started Y Cycles and the goal with Y Cycles was never to make it the biggest company in the world. It was the, the whole goal was to make really cool bikes that mm -hmm. I thought were, were sweet, that I wanted. I wanted a gravel bike and I wanted a titanium 
plus hardtail. And I got to say, it was really weird after selling Borealis, not just being given bikes from the coolest companies. <laughs> like at the time, <laughs> you know, like I rode Santa Cruz bikes because they were they thought what we were doing was really sweet. Huh. And so we kind of had this like unofficial partnership. Um, I'd get, you know, free parts from Schramm or whatever. As soon as I sold Borealis, all of a sudden, I have to go buy bikes at full retail, but I was a bike <laughs> nerd. I need eight bikes in my garage. Yeah. That's, that's a lot of money. So I was like, I, I need my gravel bike and a hardtail and full suspension bike. So I was like, I'm just going to make them. And, huh. and I think I can make them better than some other bikes out there. And then I think that's a company that I'd kind of proven that model before with the fat bikes in my own head. If I can make a bike that I want to ride, I think other people are going to want to ride it too. So I started Y Cycles and I started Revel at the, at the same time. Where are um, we at on the timeline? Give me month and date. We're 2016, late summer. 2016, late summer. Yep. Okay. Sold and it's a, and it's joint. It wasn't Y then Revel. It was kind of both at the same. It was. It was Y Cycles first, but with the idea that, well, we're making carbon full suspension bikes, but it takes a lot longer to make a carbon full suspension bike than it yep. does to make a titanium hardtail. But the idea was there yeah. kind of simultaneously. Why? Yep. Yeah. Okay, yep. good to... Yep, exactly. Yeah. Idea was there. I was just a bike nerd that wanted a bunch of different bikes. <laughs> and uh, and so, and with all this, I was like, no matter what business I do, I'm going to own more than 51% of it. Hmm. I, knew, I learned my lesson that way. And I was going to hire a lawyer to set up all the documents the right way the, the first time and, and, and do everything right from the beginning. And, and I did. And I did all that. And to this day, I, I, I still do all that. And it's been amazing. So... So, so with that, I didn't have a ton of funding. Um, I had the money I'd gotten from Borealis, I dumped all that in. Jason was really helpful. I was able to you know, rent space from him really cheap. He gave me a ton of free advice, gave me a lot of connections. And so I started Y Cycles with a thought that any, I, could, I could start selling product in probably eight to 12 months with the Y Cycles products, whereas it would take probably three years to make the Rebel products. Mm -hmm. So we launched, let's see, I might have been off on the timeline. We launched Rebel. Or sorry, we launched Y 2016. Now you have too many companies. Yeah, yeah, you can't. it's confusing. <laughs> but either way, there's like sold Borealis like six months off, then started Y, launched Y the next summer. So we're, yeah, that was it was 2016. Um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I would say that you're not old enough to not be remembering like the right years. <laughs> but I actually kind of think you've packed a lot into these yeah. years. So I think it's fair to not read. Well, like, thanks I for I making can't. me feel. I, yeah. I, I, yeah, the numbers are confusing sometimes. I'm good at bike geometry and not much <laughs> else. Uh, so we started selling Y cycles and, and it went great. And again, we never thought that was gonna be like the craziest big thing ever. But it was really interesting. I mean, for about a year and a half in there when I ran Y cycles in Ogden, it was me in a warehouse and I had one employee and I paid that employee on a per bike basis. You know, I sell a bike and here's your hundred bucks to build it and pack it and get it out to the customer. And it was just a totally different business model. Our volume was so low, but they were high end. A lot of times they were custom built bikes. We did, you know, we still do gravel bikes, hardtails. Uh, we made a titanium dirt jumper purely for fun. Hmm. Um, it was just a very different business experience than Borealis. We're Borealis. We were always trying to sell the most stuff and grow as fast as we can. And with why I was like, you know what, let's, let's take our time. Any money we make is going to go into the development of well, more Y products, but rebel products. And we'll just do it right. Make sure people are stoked. And I was lucky enough to not have all this financial pressure. Um, and it was really fun. I rode my bike a lot. It was mm -hmm. a great time. And I learned a ton. I, I made sure to go to Asia way more than I needed to. So I could learn everything about metal fabrication with the Y stuff. And then as much as I could about carbon fabrication with, with rebel. So, why I was kicking along, doing great, hired a few more people, really started on the Rebel side of things. And I, I met a guy named uh, Chris Canfield, who was is kind of the backbone of a lot of the stuff you see on, on, on these bikes. So Chris Canfield had a company called Canfield Bikes. Yeah. He developed the Canfield Balance Formula suspension patent. And I knew with Revel and with making a carbon full suspension bike that I wanted it to be different than everything else out there. I didn't want to just have another bike with a DW link or, 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 or a horse link or something. I said, there's enough of that. I, don't, I wanted to add some level of value. And so the suspension system is where you can add your value. And I knew we could do some cool stuff with carbon because Jason was was helpful. I knew we could do cool stuff with the factories and the aesthetics and all that, but the suspension platform is the backbone of a full suspension mountain bike. So I rode Chris Canfield's bike. After 100 yards, I was like, holy shit, this is the best riding bike ever. And I kind of knew it would be, but I rode it and I was like, this is like, 
there's something special here. And they were a small company selling a few hundred bikes a year, all in aluminum, all kind of like heavy Red Bull Rampage sort of bikes. Um, but they just they were just two guys who liked to ride a lot and made the best suspension system. And I thought, if we can apply this suspension system to a little more mainstream bike, make it out of carbon, make it a little more modern geo, that was something special. So as soon as I talked to Chris, I was like, all right, it's game on for, for Revel. Um, and it was actually really funny because I talked to some other suspension patent holders who have their you know, systems. Here's what it costs and here's the licensing fee and all that. And so when I rode Chris's bike, I, you know, I said, okay, hey man, can I license your suspension patent? And he huh. said, he said, hell yeah, that's cool. And I said, cool, how's it work? And he said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, how much does it cost? Like, what do I have to pay you per bike I sell? And he said, I don't know, you know, you, you, you tell me. And so I said, cool, I'll write, I'll write something up. So, you know, we wrote something up and had some back and forth. And for them, it, it was just such a passion driven um, hmm. uh, company. And so working with Chris was fantastic. I learned more about suspension kinematics than I ever could have hoped for. We'd have these Skype calls that were like three hours long where he'd share the screen and drag pivot points around mm -hmm. and do all the math of like, well, if you move the middle pivot two millimeters this way, so you have a little more water bottle clearance, it's gonna change your leverage ratio a little bit. And we laid out these badass bikes that, and that was just the beginning of it. Then I brought on a guy named, I guess through all this, I kind of knew I know a little bit about a lot of things, but not a lot about each step of it. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of wanted to get this group of people uh, that would be sort of the best minds I could think of to, to help me make Revel. I mean, I wanted it to be the best mountain bike out there. So Jeremiah Starkey was a guy kind of knew through the Borealis days, Colorado Springs. Um, he was main engineer at Rock Shocks, and he we'd kind of been talking, and so he jumped on board early on, just kind of as an advisor, helping out with some of the kinematic layout that I was working on with Chris Canfield, um, and helped with some of the engineering stuff from the beginning. So that's when it you know really all that started. I found a guy um, to do all the aesthetic stuff, the industrial design on the bikes. So at this time we had Chris Canfield, suspension guy, Jeremiah Starkey, mechanical engineer, uh, suspension guy, uh, Jason Shears for composite carbon layup guy. And then I found a guy named Mike Giese, who was this young kid, ridiculously talented rider, Steezy Giese on Instagram, you should follow him. Um, and he's an industrial designer. And so he does, he makes all of the, he makes bikes look pretty. So the 3D shapes, makes all the curves and whatnot to make them look cool. And so we had this like kind of dream team and he was ridiculously talented. Um, so it was kind of full steam ahead to make the bikes. I was going to Asia every month, you know, working with these guys to do all the drawings. I'd go to Asia to try to implement things at the factory. I found this amazing factory. They were very supportive um, early on within a period of, you know, a year or so. I was like Delta's highest status because I was flying all the time <laughs> and um, was doing everything super, super stingy. Um, but it just, it just it just worked out really, really well. And so then, let's see. Trying to get my timelines right again. Yeah. 2017, things were going well with Y. The development of Revel was was going well. Um, and I thought, you know what? Love Utah, great mountains. It's just not my home. I want to move back to Colorado. Hmm. I'd always wanted to live in a small Colorado mountain town. So one day I drove through Carbondale. And I just done the Grand Traverse ski race with a buddy of mine. So Crest Butte to Aspen. And I'm not much of a skier, but I like to suffer, suffer. a little bit sometimes. Yeah. I, <laughs> so, could, yeah. I could tell. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so that was the first time I'd ever been in Carbondale it was after the ski race. And I drove through and thought, oh, shit, this place is pretty sweet. I think uh -huh. my business could be here. And about nine months later, my business was there. I wow. lived in my van for a few months up Prince Creek Road as I took trips back and forth from Ogden to Carbondale with a trailer in my van to like move everything. Uh, at the time it was me and two employees, it was really small, but I knew that was like, things were about to ramp up as we were getting ready to launch Revel. So moved to Carbondale, fell in love with it. Within a few weeks, I just, it's such a good network, such a good supportive community. There's bike trails everywhere. It's a town of 6,000 people, 30 miles away from here, 40 miles away from yeah. here as the crow flies four hour drive, <laughs> right? <laughs> a whole lot of mountains in between. Right. Uh, and, and it was just such a rad community. And I, and I kind of, that was sort of like emblematic of, Hey, this company is about doing things a little bit differently. You know, probably the most practical thing to do would be to have this business near the Denver airport, near the Salt Lake airport or on ice 
80 for shipping or, you know, having a 3PL in Houston where shipping stuff's cheaper, whatever it is. And I thought we're going to run a business in a town of 6,000 people in the mountains um, because it's just about passion and bike trails and having fun and having the right people. And so everything was about getting the right, the right people in the right place. And so that's where Carbondale really kicked things off. Hmm. Kept on working on the bikes. Why was growing? We hired more people. Chris Reichel came on as head of marketing. He was head of marketing at Industry 9 at the time. I'd kind of become friends with him. Long story short, we did a uh, we had to go to Eurobike every year, this big trade show in Germany. Yeah. He hit me up one day and was like, hey, instead of flying to Switzerland, do you want to just fly to, or if, instead of flying to Germany, do you want to just fly to Switzerland and then ride our bikes at the trade show? And I said, you know, hell yeah, that's great. And so I actually wore these Birkenstocks and did a Birkenstock, uh, bike tour across Switzerland with Chris Reichel and told him about Revel at the time. And, huh. and then he became, he's like, all right, and I'll, I'll be your marketing guy. And so he came on board a, a little later on and he's been a great guy to help kind of tell the story of, of the company. Huh. Um, so then we launched, fast forward a little bit to 2019 and we launched Revel March 1, 2019. March 1, 2019. Okay. Wow. That was kind of a whole bunch of rambling. I'm, I'm, like, and I'm out of breath. <laughs> I, I'm just like, I'm exhausted listening to this story. I'm like, huh. Okay. So you have cleared up a whole lot of questions I've sort of had about <laughs> your background and, and the trajectory of these different companies. So I think you've done a good job so far, but honestly coming in, um, Again, I, at this point, I'm just asking questions for myself, and I'm, I don't know, frankly, if some of this will be like, yeah, yeah, people already know this part of the Revel story, but I think this will be worth walking you through, uh, having you answer some of these questions. Um, you know, that that sort of was, it's always kind of my first question anymore. If it's a new ski company, if it's a new running shoe company, if it's a new uh, bike company, um is sort of the question of like, why, right? Like, turns out, um, I think there are a lot of pretty good running shoes in the world. There's a lot of good mountain bikes out there in the world. There's a lot of good skis being made. And so I think, you know, you've already said like suspension was something that mattered. And I think you did a great job of talking about the kind of proposition with Borealis, like let's go lightweight, um, a lightweight fat bike, right? And Y cycles with titanium and, and making, you know, beautiful looking bikes. But I'd like to hear a bit more. Um, God, I hate this term and I can't believe I'm going to use it because, but like sort of that value proposition, right? So if somebody's on the market and just pick your category of bike, whatever it is you're into, I guarantee there's at least five to 10 pretty interesting options in that space. So how do you try to address that or how would you talk about um what somebody is getting or might be able to find by going with a revel bike that isn't already being done let i'll just leave it at that yeah for sure and and that's a good question i mean that's when i started y cycles and revel i wanted to make something different and better than what else was out there and there's so many good mountain bikes i mean the number of people that said why the hell are you starting mm -hmm. a full suspension carbon bike company you know you're one person with limited funding mm -hmm. why would you do that mm -hmm. there lots of companies make fantastic bikes mm -hmm. um, and they were totally right uh, what i wanted to do was i kind of came from that racing cross-country road background but then i was really hooked on like going downhill on mountain bikes and jumping on stuff and i did feel that a lot of the bikes on the market were really good at one of those things and not the other. A lot of bikes are great at pedaling uphill, but not very good at pedaling mm -hmm. downhill. And every bike company kind of says it's the most efficient uphill and the, and the yeah. you know best cornering no downhill. But that's just the most cliche marketing thing ever. And I'm going to say the same thing. Our bike's the best at going uphill and the best at going downhill. And I truly believe that. And I can get really techie and geeky about all the reasons why. But I did feel that in the market, full suspension mountain bikes, there wasn't a bike that that could do both things very well. And I thought with a little more work and some tweaking on the suspension side of things, we could make a big hit bike that was super fun to go downhill, pedal uphill like a cross country bike. And and I believe we've done that, that the reviews we've gotten in magazines all over the world have said, have said that. So I think at this point that's now been validated. Um, at the same time, we also just wanted to do things our own way. I wanted to work with people I liked. Mm -hmm. 
I was number one. I wanted to have fun. I wanted to spread, you know, positivity and goodness. We're selling really fun toys that get people outside exploring nature. We just wanted to do things our own way. Um, with Y cycles, the value proposition w was really, it was a modern take on traditional titanium. Not many companies were making titanium bikes, but with modern geometry and modern angles and modern tire clearances and through axles and integrated headsets and all that cool stuff. So Y cycles was kind of this artistic, but modern shreddy bike made out of a material traditionally seen as kind of more old school, but titanium's amazing. I love titanium. Hmm. Um, and those bikes kind of had this whole artistic thing. Like every bike has a different chain stay, a, a quote laser etch on the chain stay that like, you know, like Edward Abbey quotes and kind of like the hippie side of me, I got kind of artistic with hmm. some custom stuff there. Um, so Y cycles, modern take on traditional titanium revel bikes, most advanced full suspension bikes on the market. That's a big, I mean, those words are easy to say, right? I mean, <laughs> 100%, like, yeah. yeah. And when you say things like we wanted to make the best bike out there, whew, that's a big claim, right? And so um, this is, I think, what we're going to do. Like I said, I'm exhausted. I've been on this <laughs> <laughs> whirlwind trajectory of your life. I think we're going to do this. Um, I'm going to have you answer maybe a little more in brief some of the well here's how we're going to pull off the rather big claims you're making maybe we're going to talk about a couple products then what we're going to do is end this conversation because now i definitely need a beer we're going to break for a bit i'm going to get a beer and then we are going to call this a wrap in terms of this episode of bikes and big ideas and i i really have enjoyed here here in this entire trajectory um we're gonna wrap come back and then we're gonna dork out on some of the material stuff uh, we're gonna talk about wheels we're gonna talk about some of the things you're up to and i think we're gonna throw that over on our gear 30 platform um so if, does that sound okay to you sounds, as long as you bring me another beer okay. I'll, I'll talk about that all okay. day long <laughs> so so i guess to close this for the moment um so talk a little bit about again i think it's everybody would like to say we're gonna go make the best bike and do it better than everybody else give us a little bit of the bullet points on like how tactically you thought you could go about that and then again we can break and sort of yeah. dive down those rabbit holes yeah, so I mean, I had a lot of skepticism when we said that um, getting, <laughs> getting investors on board early was difficult. Now, huh. now I get to say no to investors. Um, huh. I, Wait, well, I might want to ask you about that part of it too. But, but yeah, we'll talk about that all. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so, so, so suspension system, CBF platform. Chris Canfield's suspension design was amazing. I knew we could do the best with carbon fiber, and besides that, I wanted to make something look really good. And I wanted a really good customer service. It's yeah. pretty simple. Lots of good companies out there. Um, but I do think we did that. We, we launched the brand and the bikes. I mean, we got this first look review in Pink Bike the day we launched. And I remember reading it and reading through it, this article. And it was the best Pink Bike review you've ever read. Pink Bike's notoriously kind of uh, critical, as they should be. They have mm -hmm. good reviews because they're, they point out good and bad things. And this was like this glowing review of the, of the rail. And I was reading it and reading it and thinking, holy shit, I think we got we got something here. And then there's, you know, hundreds of pink bike comments and they were all really positive. And we'd hear for months people would say, Wait, no one was like trash talking Trashing. you guys. Yeah. Like that never happens. And so the it, everything came together. We had a really good company of great people who were dedicated, diehard. I mean, most of them were living at my house because we were all trying to save money and I was trying to pay my mortgage. So we'd like four or five of us who worked there were all living in the same house. We worked like 14 hour days and we'd all go bike riding. And, and it was really, Revel happened because, it sounds cliche, but it truly happened because of this group of dedicated people, both on the design side and then on the company uh, production side of things. And we launched and we sold out in three days and we got more bikes in and we sold out in a week and we got more bikes in. We sold out three times in the first two months. That first summer, which was only last summer, less than a year ago right now, we were telling consumers it would be uh, 11 week wait time to get their bike and people were waiting. And I was just like, that's crazy. Holy hell, what did, what did we do? So the reviewers all liked the bike. We got great positive press. Um, it was just kind of a perfect storm of we had a great product and a great company, and I couldn't be more proud of it. Hmm. Give me the bullet points of what else you got. Now there's Revel Wheels. Yeah. Yeah, so we launched the brand a, a, just over a year ago with the Rail and the Rascal. Yeah. Um, 
two bikes. We have another bike coming out in about a month here that I won't tell you what it is, but I'm super freaking excited about it. So stay tuned on that. Two months ago, we launched a line of products called Revel Wheels. So these things are made uh, in Southern Utah, about four hours away from here. They are completely different than any other wheel on the market. So it's really easy to go make a carbon wheel, stick your company name on it and say, look, we're a wheel manufacturer now. But back to, we, I wanted to do things differently and, and better. I got this really cool partnership with this manufacturing company that came up with this material that's basically a really fancy modern thermoplastic carbon fiber. Um, so I, I'll try to make it really brief, but a good friend of mine named Joe Stanish, he was one of the main guys at Envy. He reached out to me before we even launched Revel. He had ridden a Revel and actually bought one before we launched it because he said it was his favorite bike of all time. Ex-pro World Cup downhill racer for Santa Cruz. Super talented guy who's now like a composites genius making the biggest moves in, in, in the industry. He had been working on this material for several years and developed this new type of um, thermoplastic and reached out to me before we launched Revel to say, hey, do you guys want to be our first partner to develop a wheel out of this? And hmm. I said, before we could even finish a sentence, I yeah. said, hell, hell yeah, I mean, yeah. I, that's the best thing ever. So um, we were talking about it. It was actually a few weeks of going through conversations with him before you know, and we knew the material was way lighter than traditional carbon. It was made in completely automated, made by robots manufacturing way. There is no waste. There's no sanding that needed to happen. It was a super consistent, way stronger, way lighter um, material and product than any other wheel on the market. And I was like, hell yeah, this is the coolest thing ever. Can't wait to, you know, launch this thing. And then a couple of weeks into the conversations, he said, oh yeah, and it, it's, it's actually recyclable. And I kind of said, wait, what? <laughs> wait a second, yeah. like, like lead with that. This is a carbon that's recyclable, which had sort of people had tried to do it, but it was more expensive to recycle traditionally epoxy filled carbon than, than it was just to make new stuff. So there, it, there was really no such thing as a recyclable composite on the market. And this material is recyclable. Um, and I'm actually very proud to say that right here, as of a few days ago, we, we made our very first product out of the recycled carbon rims that we you know broke in testing or the scrap material for manufacturing we have we have, we have a tire lever right here not the most uh, fascinating product but it's kind of <laughs> kind of here to show that this stuff's recyclable we made a tire lever that is the strongest freaking tire lever on the market um, we're going to make a video to kind of publicly release this in a little bit but huh. um uh so when i found out that there's this this material and product that is stronger lighter uh, it actually rides better. It has this nice, damped, comfortable, quiet feel to it. Stronger, lighter, better ride feel, made in America, and recyclable. Coolest thing ever. So we launched this line of wheels two months ago. It's been very well received. Uh, we have 29, 27, five wheels. We have a couple more coming out um, in the future. And the goal is then to use this material and manufacturing process and long-term be able to make everything out of it. And I think that's really gonna change, not the face of just the bike industry, but the whole outdoor industry, consumer products industry, to be able to make stuff here in America in a new way and in a slightly more sustainable and environmentally friendly way. I need a beer. I do too. Um, let's break there and uh, yeah. And then uh, we're gonna come back in and kind of dive into where we just left off and uh, I'm looking forward to getting into some of these details. So for now though, I will thank you for giving us the run up on this story and um, what an interesting trajectory and uh, you got going and uh, thanks I, for listening to all my yeah. rambling, rambling stories of my past. <laughs> <laughs> um, this has been fun. Let's break and uh, talk again about some of this. We'll pick it up in a minute. All right, man. Thanks. Thanks.